The scripture for today is from Galatians 6, verses 1 through 10. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have an opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ginger. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. We'll be in verses 1 through 10 as we wrap up our current sermon series that I've entitled Membership Has Its Responsibilities. We've been looking through these epistles or these letters that Paul writes to the churches that he has planted. As I've told you each Sunday, uh, these are letters that have been shared with us, but they were originally directed towards specific churches that Paul had uh, planted and started from scratch. He had nurtured them up to the point where he could leave them in somebody else's hands and then he would move on. And as he was on his missionary journeys, he would give word about how they were doing. He would write them and he would say, hey, these are the things that I hear that you're doing really well. Congratulations on that. Here are some areas that you need to work on. In the midst of this, I've tried to craft a list of uh, different qualities that Paul calls his churches and by extension calls all of us to try to achieve, try to uh, manifest in our own lives as we seek to follow Jesus as well. And so we are wrapping up today. Last week, just to uh, review, we talked about what, uh, what it means to be engaged. Paul calls upon the church to be engaged with one another. He calls upon the members of the church to not just be sometime attenders, not just to be passive participants, not just to be critics, but also to be deeply engaged in the work of the church from the heart. And so we talked about these three different levels that believers are intended to move through that Paul lays out. He says we start out being rescued, but we need to grow. We need to continue to move to the second step, which is where Christ repurposes us, changes our purpose in life, and then finally reassigns us to new work within the body of Christ. And our summary for last week's message was that salvation is just the first of many steps to where Christ calls us so that we can be his hands and his feet in the world. We don't just get stuck at salvation, but instead we commit to growth and to sanctification throughout the time that we have here on earth. And so this week we pick up with this final installment uh, as we talk about uh, being kind to one another, being uh, gracious to one another. And this is a letter that is written to the church at Galatia. Uh, Galatia is actually a cluster of churches. It's three different churches that are located or were located in what is today uh, the country of Turkey. So this would be very similar in United Methodist terms to a pastor having a three-point charge. Perhaps you know in McPherson County there are three different very small churches within a reasonable distance of one another and Paul was traveling around and he was ministering to each of these and these churches were built along uh, this vast and very well-kept Roman highway system. Uh, the Romans as they uh, expanded their empire figured out that in order to be able to move troops where they needed to go 
they needed to have a very wide and clear and safe highway system. And so those who were taken over or annexed by the Romans during this particular time got to benefit from these highways. And so these towns in the region of Galatia were located along this highway system. And as often happens, they built up businesses and they had ways of making a living. And most of the families in these churches uh, made their day-to-day -day living by providing services to Roman troops and to travelers and to other merchants who were coming along that highway system. And like many people who end up having a lot of exposure to the military experience, uh, they started to take on some of the characteristics, some of the attitudes, some of the traits of the military people that they interacted with on a daily basis. If you know very much about the Roman army, you know that Roman soldiers were extremely hard and ruthless and uh, very blunt individuals. It was a very difficult life. Uh, the Romans didn't really care how you felt about things or about extenuating circumstances. There was duty, and you either accomplished your duty or you didn't. And if you did not, there were very harsh consequences for that. And so because of these attitude shifts, conflicts began to arise in the church at Galatia. They were very heartless. They were very cruel. They were very uh, hard on one another. And part of this, much, much of what Paul is writing about here, has to do with these conflicts between the Jewish Christians and the new converts. This is not a conflict that was unique to the churches at Galatia, uh, but Paul specifically deals with this because you have people who had been raised, born and raised in the Jewish tradition with lots of laws and lots of standards to keep, and they felt like when they converted to what was that at that time called the way, uh, that today we call Christianity, that they were bringing a lot of these Jewish traditions with them, these laws, and that in order to be a real follower of Jesus, you had to also be a Jew. And at the meantime, in the meantime, Paul was also bringing in these new converts from the pagan traditions. And they were brand new to all of these ideas, all of this stuff. And they didn't like a lot of the stuff that the Jewish converts were trying to impose upon them. And so there was this clash of two sides. One side saying, if you're a real Christian, you do this. And the other side saying, I don't want to do that. I want to start my own tradition, my own way of doing things. And one of the main ones that they were fighting about was that the Jewish Christians were saying, you have to be circumcised. If just because you're a Christian and not a Jew doesn't mean that circumcision does not also have to take place. And as you can imagine, there were some people who were balking at this a little bit. And I can completely understand that. Uh, so as Paul addressed this in Galatians chapter 5, he sets uh, kind of the thematic statement for the entire letter, which we're going to focus on today, which is this. He says, you know, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free, that he has saved us. And so because of that, do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Stop trying to enslave one another to the law. Stop trying to enslave one another to your attitudes, to your false standards. But instead, be kind, be gracious to one another. Uh, so I want to talk for just a minute about the power of kindness. There's actually been a lot of research done about the psychological effects, the biological effects, the spiritual and emotional effects of choosing to be kind. One of the things that the research tends to show is that when we choose to commit acts of kindness to one another, unwarranted many times, but still a choice, uh, it promotes the release of a neurotransmitter called oxytocin in both the person who does the giving and the one who does the receiving. And you've heard me talk about oxytocin before. It's kind of a magical neurotransmitter. They've actually uh, developed synthetic forms of it now that you can sniff like a nasal spray. And, uh, it's pretty cool stuff, but the, the main thing that I always tell my students about with oxytocin is it's responsible for the survival of the human race because oxytocin is released uh, for the first time in most people's lives right after they're born. So the mother goes through sometimes hours and hours of excruciating labor and she's screamed and she's cried and she said hateful things to the people around her and in her mind she's thinking I'm never going through this process again and then they clean up the baby they put the baby in her arms and when their skin touches the bodies of both parties releases this oxytocin and they nickname oxytocin the amnesia neurotransmitter because this feeling just washes down over the mother and she forgets all the pain and all the suffering and she just focuses on loving this child and the child looks up into the eyes of the mother and bonds with her and so one of the easiest ways to uh, release oxytocin in your own body is to give another person a hug but also to do kind 
things for them. It's good stuff. We know that when we do kind things for other people, studies have shown that it also decreases our perception of pain. So when you're having a bad day, general rule of thumb is do something kind for somebody. It'll make your day better. We know that kindness has actually been shown to slow the aging process. And I don't know about you, but that's pretty good news to me. I, I feel motivated to be a little more kind just so I can make that happen. It increases our sense of self-worth. When we're kind people, others are drawn to us, they want to be around us and spend more time with us. And we know that <laughs> kindness can also ease symptoms of grief and of depression. When we are suffering, when we reach out and we focus on other people, it eases our own struggles. Uh, the Scottish pastor Alexander McLaren always urged his followers, he said, kindness makes a person attractive. And so if you could win the world, melt it. Do not hammer it. This is the essence of what Paul is telling the believers at Galatia. Our foundational thought for this morning is that mature Christians are very much aware of how their actions and how their attitudes reflect on Christ. I've quoted pretty liberally from Tom Rainer during this sermon series, and I've borrowed uh, some of these ideas from a book of his that I've told you about called I Will, about uh, being an outwardly focused church member, and some of you have asked about that book, and so I've put it on the back shelf back there if you'd like to read it, like to go through it. It has some really good ideas in it, but here's what he says. He says, really it boils down to a difference between being a Christian and a churchianist. He says, churchianity is about being served. It's about receiving, getting your way. It's about insisting on your wants and your needs before others. On the other hand, biblical church life, what we're going to be talking about this morning, is the opposite. It's about serving, sacrificing. It's about giving and putting others before our desires and needs. And so this morning, we're going to answer the question, what is gracious living? But we're also going to identify three <coughs> barriers that stand between us and engaging in biblical Christianity. We're going to see that arrogance serves as a barrier, that carelessness serves gets in the way, and finally that discouragement can keep us from being gracious believers. Our one sentence sermon for this morning is that we are called, each and every one of us, to shape our approach to others' imperfections to the image of Christ. There is not one perfect person in this building this morning, and I include myself in that statement, but our approach to one another in light of those imperfections needs to reflect who Jesus is, the life of Christ within us. And so we begin with the first barrier, which is arrogance. Notice what Paul says here. He says, if you think that you're too important to help someone, you're really only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Daniel Kahneman is a very well-known cognitive psychologist. He's done a great deal of notable research. He's written extensively on several different subjects, but one of those that was very near and dear to his heart is this idea of where we get our confidence or sometimes our sense of overconfidence. Uh, Kahneman was a Jew, is a Jew, and he was raised in Europe uh, in the time leading up to and during World War II. And his family uh, was trapped in France as it was occupied by the Germans. And so he was, as a young boy, was one of those people that had to wear the yellow star on his clothing when he went out in public. His father was actually grabbed up by the SS and was imprisoned and was treated very harshly for more than six weeks before he was released and it did such damage to his health that he ended up dying. And Kahneman has very vivid images of walking up and down the streets in terror, wondering if he was also going to be dragged off to prison at some point. But the thing that stuck with him was how ridiculous uh, the notions that the followers of Hitler adopted for themselves, this sense of overconfidence in their own superiority and how that led to the way that they treated their fellow human beings. And so in his research, he noted that the overconfidence he felt like was the most common and also the most damaging of human foibles. And one of the examples that he gives is a study that I cite a lot of times with my students. When they survey Americans and they ask them, compared to other drivers in this country, do you feel like you are below average, average, or better than average? And about 93% of Americans say, Better than average, way better than average driver right here. And that leads to the kind of attitudes that we all see as we're out driving on the highway. On the days that I have to go to Wichita and I'm driving on 135, I find myself doing it as well. I come up and somebody's in the passing lane and they're not going as fast as I would like them to go. And so I feel perfectly justified in getting right up on their bumper and letting them know they're in my way. 
Uh, that's probably not the best practice. Uh, a driver's ed teacher would probably tell you that's not the way to handle it. Uh, but because I feel like I'm a better driver than that other person and I'm overconfident in my abilities and skills, I follow them too closely and I sometimes harass them until they move over out of my way and I feel resentful toward them because they've impeded my progress. So uh, we all do that to some degree. I hope it's not just me. Overconfidence also allows us to divide people into two different camps. We have me, the people who are like me, who think like me and like the same things I like and do the things that I do, and they, the people who are different from me. And we divide people into those two camps and one is always better than the other. And finally, Kahneman says that it dooms us to continue to repeat our mistakes. We don't learn because we don't see it as wrong. When asked what he would do with all of his body of research over the course of his life, what he would change. Uh, he said, you know, if I had a magic wand, the one thing I would eliminate is overconfidence. And this is what Paul is talking about, this idea of arrogance. Uh, the word that he uses here, he says, you're not that important. And the word in the Greek, medais, uh, literally means not even one. In other words, it's this idea that you're not even a little bit important, not even one iota of you is important enough to criticize others, to treat others badly uh, without Jesus in your life. And you can see the idea of how this word is used in the language in Luke 9, chapter 3, uh, or chapter 9, verse 3, when uh, Jesus sends out the disciples and, and he tells them, take nothing, take made ice, take what for your journey? So in other words, he's saying you're not contributing anything to this particular process. I am giving you everything that you need. God, my Father, will provide for you as you follow in my will. Don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, food, money, or even a change of clothes. I don't know about you, but that would take a lot of faith for me to have to follow that. And so when we accept that we're not the most important person in the room, we're having to rely on God. We're having to show faith. You see, arrogance displaces God as the authority in our lives. When we live as if I have something more vital to contribute than everybody else in the room, when I decide I'm the best driver, I'm the best Christian, I'm the best whatever it is, because of that, I miss out on God's best. And I may be causing others around me to miss out on God's best. And so for each of these three points, I'm going to give you some examples of what this might look like in everyday church life. And before I start sharing these examples, I want to tell you, I had nobody from this church in mind when I came up with these examples. These are things that I've encountered in past churches, in my earlier life. Uh, so if you feel like this is you, you feel convicted by some of these examples, it's not me thinking of you, but it may be the Holy Spirit tapping you on the shoulder. I, I have nothing to do with this, so my hands are clean. Are you ready? Okay. Arrogance might look like this. Real United Methodists sing We Three Kings on Epiphany Sunday. Uh, this is what I encountered at the first church I served in, and uh, the pastor decided to be gone to visit his uh, kids, his adult children, uh, after Christmas that week after, so he asked me to preach and to plan the service, and not being raised as a United Methodist, I foolishly just kind of planned and went along with it, and some people absolutely lost their minds because I didn't do the scripture about the three wise men bringing their gifts, and we didn't sing We Three Kings. And I got lit up on social media. Uh, Facebook was full of people who were outraged, and I was labeled as not a real United Methodist, and I said guilty. I, I guess I'm not. I'm sorry. Uh, another one. Real Christians only read from the King James Version of the Bible. In other words, if you're using the New Living Translation like I do most of the time in my sermon, you're not a real Christian. Uh, another one, maybe this one uh, you might have experienced before. Uh, if they can't control their kids, then they shouldn't come to worship until they learn how. Uh, the assumption is, I'm so important that things that irritate me, things that distract me, uh, should not happen. They should not exist, no matter what problems it might cause other people around me. In other words, it's a difference, essentially, between preferences and requirements. These are all preferences that people have, but they are not requirements to be a member of the body of Christ. They are not requirements to participate in worship on a week-to-week -week basis. Here's our first key point, which is that the holier and the more quote-unquote right we believe ourselves to be, the greater the temptation we experience to begin to look down on and to dismiss others. 
Overconfidence is deadly to our relationship with other believers, and it compromises our relationship with Christ. Charles Spurgeon, the great uh, preacher, says this. He says, do not think that just because you believe the right doctrines, that therefore you're right. There are many that believe right, but they act wrong, and they perish. Don't be overconfident. Always be asking yourself, how do my thoughts, how do my attitudes towards others line up with the life of Christ within me? Jesus exposes this with the Pharisees when he scolds them publicly in Matthew 23. He says, you are like whitewashed tombs that look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and of everything unclean. They were arrogant, they were ugly on the inside, and because of that, they were rejected. So arrogance is the first barrier to graciousness. The second one is carelessness. Paul continues to caution the people at Galatia, and he says, instead, pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. Robert Rosenthal was uh, another psychologist in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s, and much of his work was done uh, in the education field, observing teachers and their interactions with their students and trying to find out what were the factors that led to success in education and what were ones that led to failures. And so he came up with these two different effects in 1968 based on some very famous studies that he did. And he called them the Pygmalion effect and the Golem effect. Uh, you may be familiar with the study. What he did was he had a group of teachers in uh, Oregon and at the beginning of the year he randomly divided uh, the students in the classes into two different groups and he called one the high IQ group and one the low IQ group. And he told these teachers that he had done IQ tests on the students and they had been assigned to these different groups based on their scores. The reality was he didn't test anybody's IQ, uh, but he just randomly assigned them. And so he followed these teachers throughout the course of the year. And at the end of the year, he looked at the test scores for the students at the beginning versus at the end and also the teachers' attitudes about these students. And what he found was that much of how the students did was a self-fulfilling prophecy. If the teachers thought the student was a part of the high IQ group, those students improved the most over the course of the year. And those who they thought were in the low IQ group either didn't improve or actually decreased their performance over the course of the year. And the teachers were willing to admit, yeah, I divided these kids in my mind and I spent way more time and effort on the high IQ kids and less on the low IQ kids. And so uh, this idea of creating good outcomes because of good attitudes, he called the Pygmalion effect and the bad attitudes based on bad expectations, he called the Golem effect. And you can see uh, the graphic there of how our actions and our beliefs begin to become this self-fulfilling prophecy, this spiral that can either spiral up or spiral down depending on how we look at our situation. Rosenthal explained it in his research and he said the Golem effect, this negative expectation cycle, conditions people to achieve less through lowered expectations. In other words, if I have lowered expectations for you, I'm going to send you an unconscious message that I don't expect very much from you, and therefore you shouldn't expect very much from you either. And so you're going to respond by doing less and acting in a different way. And it goes on and on and on. And this is what Paul is talking about here. He's saying don't divide people in your minds into those who are worthy of your attention and respect and those who are not. So he says instead of focusing on other people, Focus on what you're doing. Worry about yourself. Careful attention here in the Greek is a word that means to examine closely. It means to approve by testing or for our purposes, it means to find the good in something. In other words, in the midst of a less than perfect situation, working with less than perfect people, find something good. Find a reason to care about the people that God places in your path. Find a reason to believe in the people that God has put in your life. Find a reason to follow where God is leading. Uh, he talks about this in 1 Corinthians 11 as well. And he says, he's talking about the, the Lord's Supper. And I think we talked about this when we studied the church at Corinth. That they had divisions like Galatia as well. They had the rich people and the poor people. And the rich people didn't want to hang out with the poor people. And so when they would have the Lord's Supper, the rich people would get there ahead of time and they would have a big party and they'd drink too much and eat all the food. And then they'd let the poor people come in and eat the scraps. And Paul said, this cannot continue to happen. He said, instead, you need to examine yourself to find something good 
that good in yourself before you eat the bread and drink the cup. In other words, locate the Jesus within you and ask yourself, would Jesus be acting this way or would he not? Carelessness gives first impressions and it gives past experiences more power than they deserve. Paul is telling us here that if we choose to live as if we don't have the time to really get to know other people, we're going to miss out on God's best. And I think this is very true, especially in small towns. This person didn't come from a particular family. This person had some experiences in the past that everybody knows about. This person has never been in church before, so why in the world would we waste time pursuing them? So here's some uh, examples that I came up with. And here we're looking at, is this a reality about this person, or is it just an impression that I have based on my uh, prejudices? Uh, first one, he or she is divorced. Because of that, they can't lead in the church. I've experienced that one firsthand, and I know what it's like to walk into a church full of people who you thought cared about you, and because a change has happened in your life, and somebody has decided they don't want to be married to you anymore, they decide, you know what, not only are you not worthy of leading in this church anymore, but I don't really want to associate with you anymore, because divorced people are obviously bad. They're obviously defective, and we don't want that stain on our church. Another one, he or she struggles with depression. So we can't depend on them. They have ups and downs in their life. Or the last one, he or she is too old or too young or too uneducated to serve. So therefore we write them off. All of these are impressions that we have of people, but they're not necessarily realities. Second key point, the more comfortable we get with our perceptions, the more that we rely on them, the more likely we are to simply exclude those around us who are most in need of another chance. A uh, Nigerian author that I found here says it best. She says, uh, the single story creates stereotypes, but the problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. We all have one story in our lives, a moment when we weren't our best, a moment that we would like to forget about, a moment that we are ashamed of, imperfection that we would like to hide from the rest of the world but Paul is saying that makes us who we are it doesn't um, make us unworthy it doesn't make us unfit to be a part of the body of Christ we're reminded of this in 1st Samuel uh, when God sends Samuel to find the next king of Israel and uh, Samuel keeps thinking this must be the person and God says no and he picks another person and says this has to be the guy he's good looking he's strong everybody admires him and God says no. And we go down the line and finally God explains to him, the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We can't see the heart of other people until we get to know them, until we invest our lives in them. So we cannot be careless. The last barrier is discouragement. Paul tells them, yeah, this takes time. Yes, this is a trial and error process. Yes, it's frustrating and we have to endure other people's imperfections. But at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we choose not to give up. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie. It came out a few years ago entitled Hacksaw Ridge, but it is uh, an amazing, inspiring story of a man by the name of Desmond Doss. Uh, Doss was born to a very poor family in Lynchburg, Virginia uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, he was able to finish about a sixth grade education before his family had to send him to work in a sawmill to help provide for the rest of the family. And when World War II started, uh, Doss uh, volunteered <coughs> for service. But the one problem was that they were Seventh-day Adventists, and because of that, he did not believe that it was right to take another person's life even in war. And in fact, he even refused to carry a firearm. And he received a lot of abuse. He uh, paid a price in the military for this, but finally they decided to assign him as a combat medic. And so uh, the men in his unit nicknamed him Preacher because he was constantly reading his Bible, but he distinguished himself among uh, the people in his unit. Uh, there was a battle in Okinawa at a place that came to be known as Hacksaw Ridge, and it was up on an elevated ridge that was about 100 feet above sea level, and his unit had to uh, climb up this, uh, this particular face of a cliff and on the top they encountered the enemy and the 
the battle was just brutal and there were many, many casualties and this battle lasted for about three days. And Doss, as a medic, was running everywhere. He was trying to help people, but eventually uh, the unit was forced to pull back and they left behind many, many men who were wounded. They were gravely wounded just for the enemy to take. And Doss could not stand to just sit back and watch this happen. And so by himself, he climbed back up the cliff and he began to go out among territory that had been overrun by the enemy and attend to these men and one by one began to drag them back to the edge of the cliff and lower them over to the side because nobody else would come up and help him. Over the course of a 12 hour period, Doss saved the lives of between 75 and 100 men while he was under fire and in mortal danger himself the entire time. And in fact, he was seriously wounded four different times. He ended up being disabled for the rest of his life because of the wounds he sustained. But as of today, Desmond Doss remains the only conscientious objector to ever receive the Congressional Medal of Honor, which you can see him receiving uh, there from President Truman. After Doss's death, his son was interviewed about this when the movie came out, and they said, what was it about your dad? Was he just a really extraordinary person? Uh, what made him do the things he did? What motivated him? And, and Desmond Jr. said this, which I think is just an amazing testimony. He said, my father, didn't have to be motivated to do the things he did. He did them because it was an expression of who he was. In other words, it was an expression of the life of Jesus within him. It would have been very easy for Desmond Doss to get discouraged and to give in and give up at different times along his path in life, but because he chose to continue to do what Jesus would have him do, he made an amazing impact on the lives of those around him. And I think all of us have that potential in our lives. Paul tells us, do not give up. The word in the Greek here, ekluo, means don't release, don't let go. In other words, don't faint from exhaustion. If you follow Jesus for very long, I guarantee you will reach different points. And I have reached those points before where you just look around and you go, does it really matter? It doesn't seem to matter what I do. Nothing goes right. Things don't go like I want them to go. And there's a very real temptation just to throw up our hands and say, I quit to walk away, and yet uh, the writer of Hebrews tells the believers under uh, enormous persecution in Rome at the time, he says, think of all the hostility Christ endured from sinful people, and when you do that, then you won't become weary, and you won't give up, you won't faint from exhaustion. You see, discouragement makes the prevailing emotions of the moment our standard of conduct. Rather than, what would Jesus do, it becomes, what do I feel like doing in this moment? The danger is this, when we live as if feelings are our God, our risk is that we miss out on the harvest that would have eventually come with perseverance. So what are some examples of this? Are these facts or are they feelings? I keep praying, but nothing changes, so therefore it's a waste of time, and I quit. Here's another one that I've heard many times over the years. You know what, these kids don't listen to me, they don't appreciate me, I might as well just quit. I can tell you as one of those kids who was rotten sometimes and who didn't seem like he was listening all through my experience coming up through church, I was listening. I was filing things away. I didn't look like it. I didn't always act like it. But seeds were planted that flowered later on in my life. And maybe another one here that might sound familiar to you. You know what? I've invited my neighbors to church a million times and they're not coming. I give up. Final key point. You know, the more that we rely on feelings as our primary indicator of our spiritual progress, the more time we're just going to spend stuck in frustration and confusion. We have this idea in our minds, and I'm guilty of this too, that you know, people that God really uses, people who are successful in their faith, never get sad, they never get tired, they never get discouraged. And yet, toward the end of his life, in an interview, uh, Billy Graham great Billy Graham even admitted this. He said, the Christian life is not a constant high. I have my moments of deep discouragement. And in those times, I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, God, forgive me. God, help me. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 4. He says, we have to fix our eyes not on what is seen, not what we can measure, not what is evident to us in the moment, but instead on what is unseen. But what is seen is temporary. It goes away when this world goes away, when we leave this world. But what is unseen is eternal. And that's what we're called as believers to be looking for in our lives. 
Conclusion, three different questions to ask yourself as we close this morning. Question number one, is my view of myself compared to others in line with God's? Am I looking at myself realistically? Do I see myself as better than everybody else? Have I divided camps into us versus them, me versus you? Number two, am I too set in my perception of those that God brings across my path? In other words, are we focused as a church on the certain demographic that church growth experts tell us to shoot for, or are we just saying, God, bring who you want to bring? Bring who you need to bring, and we will love them. We'll take care of them. And finally, what drives my actions on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it my feelings, or is it my faith? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth contained in it. We thank you for the challenge that you place in front, in front of each and every one of us today. God, I pray that you would continue to use this church, that you would continue to grow and to change each of us as we follow faithfully where you lead. And I ask this in Jesus' name.